Good afternoon. Welcome to Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm your host, Tim Apicella, a show that's dedicated to transportation and traffic issues. Our today's show is called Transit, the Vital Piece of, Traf of the Traffic Puzzle. My guest for today's discussion is Mark Garrity. He's the director of the Department of Transportation Services. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Well, Mark, I have more questions. I know we have time. Right. Transportation, and particularly what you folks do, um, we could probably make this into an hour and a half show easily. Mm -hmm. But it's only a half hour, so we're going to do the best we can here. Uh, Mark, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Kaka'ako area. Uh, it's been in the paper a lot lately. A lot of the uh, condominiums are now coming online. Uh, the collection and the symphony and 400 Kiavi is all coming online. So eventually we're going to have about 4,000 units, maybe even more, um, impact that particular area. And of course, that's all by design. Right. And so the question is, um, is speed and reliability, uh, particularly along uh, uh, Ala Moana and, and Nimitz and the service you have there. I think that's the 18 and 20, uh, the routes? 18, yeah, 19, 20. 20. 19, 19, 20, yeah, excuse me. A number of bus routes serve that area. Yeah. And so the question is, with all the, the new um, densities coming in, um, how do you, how, how's the speed and reliability going to work there? Well, you know, um, as you mentioned, Kakaako is essentially designed to be, to be dense, and, and it's, it, we're really um, venturing into a sort of a, a different mindset and a, and a different pattern, a different way of doing things than we've done in the past. Typically, when, we, uh, when developers have built these tall buildings, like they're building in Kakaako, um, they would put in these giant parking garages and, and design everything to be uh, driven to. Uh, people would drive to them, uh, park, and then go up into their, into their tower, and it would be completely independent from, from any, uh, every other place. But Kakaako is being designed to be a walkable community. And uh, what that means is that uh, people might still drive there, but they're going to uh, park in one location and walk between uses. There's going to be lots of restaurants on the ground floor. The, the streets are all going to be designed to be very pedestrian friendly. And that's also going to work very well with transit, uh, with our bus service that we have a lot of already, and with the new rail line coming in that's going to have two stations in Kakako. And what that means is this neighborhood is going to be feel like an urban neighborhood. It's going to be uh, very friendly for uh, people walking, bicycling, uh, getting off and on transit. And yes, people will be able to drive there, but it's not going to be oriented towards driving in the, in the way that uh, uh, past development has taken place and in the way we think of other neighborhoods in, Ho in on Oahu. Well, what if you're coming from Waikiki and, you know, you want to come into, you know, you're not living in Kakako, mm -hmm. but you're coming from Waikiki or maybe somewhere else, uh, Kahala area, and you want to come in, um, or the people that just are going to the airport and, or just transporting goods and services. Um, do you foresee any traffic patterns that are going to kind of uh, press down on Ala Moana Boulevard and, uh, and uh, Nimitz Highway? Well, uh, you know, Ala Moana is, is a major artery, and, and that's going to continue to see a lot of traffic in the future. I think what, what our hope is um, is that through the investments that we're making in, in high-capacity transit, that we're actually going to shift a lot of trips uh, that serve the urban core uh, from, from vehicles in, into transit. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Kakaako itself is going to be pedestrian-friendly in such a way that even if you're driving from another neighborhood, uh, maybe you come into town, um, you park once in one of these garages, and then you enjoy the day or the evening there without getting in your car again until the end, until you're ready mm -hmm. to go home. And then, uh, plus, there's going to be other options, not just transit, but things like uh, uh, car sharing and, and uh, Uber and Lyft and enhanced taxi service and, and that sort of thing that provide options for people. So, uh, you know, in the, in the future, we really think that the, the residents of Kakako, although they may own cars, hopefully will not feel a need to use them as much as, as people have in the past. Mm -hmm. That's really what we're counting on. You right. know, we live on a, on a relatively <clears throat> small island, and yet the population continues to grow. Um, how do we have a sustainable transportation system? In the past 20, 30 years ago, we thought, how do we move cars? But now it's about... Uh, how, how do people get around, how do people connect to the things they need to connect to. And in some cases, using a vehicle may be the best option, uh, but in other cases, uh, there are many other op options out there. And, you know, technology has helped, 
as well. Uh, using your smartphone to know when the bus is coming wasn't even an option until a few years ago. But now when you go to a bus stop, you see everybody with the same, with one of these apps, I use it all the time, telling me when the bus is coming. So knowing when the bus is coming, knowing uh, what transportation options you have, uh, makes it much more comfortable and easier to use these alternatives. Yeah, it's amazing using your apps for um, well, I won't mention the company's name, but uh, car sharing sure. and um, Uber, Lyft. I mean, right. it's, it's, it's there and it's present, and it's, it's a technology we didn't have 15 years ago. Exactly, exactly. And 5, 10, 15 years from now, there's going to be even more. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what's gonna, what you're going to see is a lot of people are going to realize, you know, it doesn't really make sense for me to own a car because I have all these other options. I can rent a car uh, for a few hours at a time if I need it. Uh, I can get a ride so easily just by, by using, my, using my smartphone that, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to pay fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 for a car and then pay to park it as well and pay for insurance and gas and all these things. And the depreciation. Yeah. yeah. So it, um, not everybody's going to make that choice. I recognize right. that. And we, we, the transportation system has to continue to work for, for everyone, including some people who drive. Uh, but we want it to serve everyone, and we want it to be sustainable, which means we want to push, uh, push the envelope and push towards uh, moving towards modes that are, that are generally more sustainable and less energy intensive, and that yeah. means things like walking, bicycling, and transit. Yeah, that's good. I, um, you did mention high-capacity transit, and when I think of high-capacity, uh, maybe I have a wrong idea about this, but it's, it's, it's when the transit lane is separated from general purpose mm -hmm. lane, and you're running very fast frequencies of maybe 15 minutes or, or even less. Mm -hmm. Do you envision a day when we, we start segregating our transit-only lanes from general purpose lanes? Well, if you're talking about buses, um, then um, yes. I'm not sure that we're going to be doing that in, in many cases. You know, right now we do run express buses, and, and of course they use the zipper lane and, and uh, uh, HOV lanes right. wherever they're available. Um, so in a sense, we do have a high capacity system in, in that regard. Um, and we also use larger articulated buses which have higher capacity and we run them fairly frequently. Uh, but we don't, you're right, we don't have dedicated lanes on the streets. And um, I'm not sure whether that uh, is in our future. It could be on, mm -hmm. on certain corridors. But I think what we're really all counting on uh, for the high capacity in, in our uh, future is, is rail itself. Right. Th these, uh, the trains that are going to be running overhead, uh, it completely independent from traffic, are going to be running very, very fast and very, very frequently. Uh, the system is going to average uh, 30 miles an hour over the, over the, the length, over the 21 miles, uh, including stops. So it runs 60 miles an hour between stations. Um, over the 21 mile length and there's 20 stations and it takes about 42 minutes to go from end to end which is all the way from the Croc Center you know out in East Kapolei mm -hmm. all the way to Ala Moana and with uh, two stations in, in Kakaako someone could theoretically live in one of these towers that you're talking about in Kakaako and then they can get to the airport in less than 15 minutes uh, Speed and reliability, the, the that's what right, it's all about Exactly, so when you talk about speed and reliability and, and um, and knowing that the train's going to come because it's completely independent from traffic. So, right. and the trains are going to run every few minutes. Uh, so you, you're not even necessarily going to need to look at your smartphone to know when the next train is coming because they'll run so frequently. You just go upstairs, go to the station. If a train just left, you're going to know that in a few minutes another one's going to be coming. Right. Well, Mark, I get an earful. I live in Waikai, so mm -hmm. I get an earful about um, all the adverse articles about rail in mm -hmm. the paper. Um, I certainly get an earful about, you know, we've gone from 5.6 billion up to 9.5 billion. And then I hear the ultimate, why couldn't we have just had a rapid transit system for a fraction of the cost and a viable, high capacity rapid transit system versus rail? And I don't have an answer for that. So, um, yeah, well, um, you know, I don't want to say you get what you pay for, but I think in, in, to a certain extent, um, we are. Uh, we are spending a lot of money on, on a rail transit system that is going to provide speed and reliability, and it's also going to provide uh, an opportunity for a new type of development around, around the stations where people can live, work, play, um, and exist uh, without owning a car. Um, a bus rapid transit system, like what I think what you're talking about, um, has some benefits of, of rail transit, but it doesn't have that level of certainty uh, to generate um, a transit-oriented development mm -hmm. around the, the individual stations. 
Um, if you go to other countries, uh, Japan is a great example. I've spent a lot of time in Japan. Uh, the train stations themselves are generators of, of development, and, and all the, the major department stores, um, major office buildings are centered around the, the train stations because that's where the accessibility is located. They know that the train is going to be running there very, very frequently for a long time because a major investment was made to put the train in. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about an investment that is going to last decades. And, and all of the stations, especially starting uh, at the Ala Moana and the Kakaako, that area, but eventually all of the stations are going to eventually become magnets to a certain extent uh, for, for development of one kind or another. Now, of course, not all of them are going to have the same type of development, and we don't want that either. You know, um, in Waipahu, uh, we want to provide the access uh, for the people out there, and there's a, already a lot of density in that area. There'll be some development around the stations, but really it's about improving accessibility for, for all members of our, of our community. And everybody, regardless of whether they drive or take the bus or use transit or, or bicycle, should have should have good access to the system. Do we have enough land? Literally, do we have enough land at each station where people can park? Or are you envisioning an, another means of getting to those rail stations versus a single occupancy vehicle? You know, uh, four of the stations will have major park and rides, mm -hmm. uh, and there'll be plenty of uh, well, there'll be a lot of parking. Uh, I, I don't I don't know if I want to say plenty because I think actually there's going to be a lot of demand. Uh, for people to, to drive to these stations and park. Um, but in a lot of cases, what I was describing is, is that we're trying to build a, a community around the rail stations where people can walk, and parking lots are not always yeah. totally compatible with that. Uh, so we have to, com we have to um, balance the, the various needs that we're trying to accomplish here. We do want to encourage people to use the train, so we want to provide accessibility, and, and in some cases that does mean providing parking for them. And, and there's going to be a very large parking garage at the intersection of H1 and H2, you know, in Pearl Highlands mm -hmm. area, um, that you'll be able to access right off, of, right off of H2 coming down from central Oahu. I think it's going to have 1,600, 1,700 parking spaces. So it's going to be a very large. Massive. Yeah, it's going to be That's a very, very large, large garage. Yeah. There's also going to be a large transit center there. So there'll be excellent bus service coming down from Wahiwa and Mililani that will also connect uh, to the to the rail station. And at all of the stations, there will be bus connections. And all of the stations will have uh, bicycle and pedestrian access and bicycle parking. And they'll be tied into the into the network. And we're improving. Uh, the crosswalks and the sidewalks and the walkable environment around the stations because that's really the most important way that people are going to access the, the stations. And think about it, even if you drive to one of the stations, that means you're getting off at a different station, right? Correct. And when you get off at that station, you want to be able to walk or get to your final destination. And that may involve walking, could involve bicycling. Remember, we're going to have bike shares starting next year. It could involve taking a taxi or an Uber or Lyft or, or hopping on a bus. So we want to make sure that all of those options are available at all of the stations wherever possible. Great. We're going to take a break, but Mark, when we come back, I'd like to talk about connectivity at these rail stations and how we actually move people from the rail car to their destination. So we'll talk about that in a moment. This is Hawaii Moving Forward. I'm Tim Apicello, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man, and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon, thinktechhawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. Aloha. My name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association. And our show is all about educating board members and owners about the responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. You can watch me live on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Welcome. We are co-hosts of a show called Keys to Success, which is live on the Think Tech Live Network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Welcome back. This is Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. I'm here today with Mark Garrity. And Mark is the director of the Department of Transportation Services. Mark, again, thank you for coming. Thanks again. Uh, before we left, we talked about, you know, connectivity, getting people from once they get off the rail car to points of destination. And um, how do you envision that? Do you envision 
um, a lot of trans smaller transit buses? Uh, do you em envision? Um, how, how do you think that connectivity is going to happen? It, it's going to be a lot of different things, Tim. So th there's. Um, uh, first and foremost, we want to create a walkable environment so that when you get off the train and you come downstairs onto the street, um, hopefully your destination, uh, it's either very close by or even if it's a, uh, a bit of a walk, that is uh, a, walky, a walkable and a pedestrian-friendly environment. If it's further away, um, maybe there's bike share available. We anticipate having uh, bike share stations at each of the rail stations and also uh, lockable areas where if you ride your bike to the to the rail station you could lock it up and make sure that way uh, when you come back a few hours later the bike is still going to be there and it's going to be safe and then as you mentioned in some cases you know we're also going to provide access for transit and and uh, that means handy van or paratransit service is going to be available at every station so uh, if you are disabled you're a regular user of handy van uh, maybe you can use both uh, the train and then when you come downstairs because of course there'll be elevators everything's uh, fully ada accessible at all of these station areas uh, hop on the hop on the the handy van or regular bus will be available at the station or nearby to take you to your to your final destination you know we talked about bus routes and and buses uh, earlier i think what i envision is that in some cases we might actually be using smaller buses in the future that provide more access to the neighborhoods and and think think about say iaa you know that area so we've got a station at pearl ridge near the mall and all of those Malka communities, some of them are well served by transit, but some are, are not so well served. But in the future, maybe we have more bus routes serving those Malka areas, but they're with smaller buses. And they are come you down. Are about demand, uh, transit yeah, demand, bit, or, or yeah. just the circulator? Yeah, and, and you know how we talked about technology earlier? Maybe it's some of the routes are you, you call it up on your phone and it actually deviates uh, from its regular route uh, to come closer to your house and pick you up. There, there's things like mm -hmm. that happening. And, and the changes in technology are making stuff like that more, um, more accessible and easier to install. Well, that sounds encouraging. It really does, um, particularly now that if I you know, want to take off in a half hour and mm -hmm. the possibility of having a transit come down my road right. just off my phone app, that would be uh, pretty spectacular. Right. I want to talk a little bit about where we are right now as far as of all the transit service hours, and I'm not sure how many, what your total is of transit service hours, uh, excluding paratransit, um, how would you classify whether they're commute related or just general purpose routes? Well, we have, um, we have a few different kinds of service. We have um, service that we would classify as something like commuter routes that, that only serve, um, only provide service during peak hours. And, and a lot of them use uh, the HOV lanes, uh, or the zipper lane, for example, and provide access sometimes in only in one direction. Um, and then we have uh, more local routes that provide uh, service up into the neighborhoods mm -hmm. like that um, on a somewhat frequent basis and all day, uh, but maybe 15 to 30 minute service. And then we have what we call our trunk urban lines, which are um, the number two, number one route, and they, they are often with our, our articulated longer buses. They're heavily used. Right. Sometimes they provide service into, into Waikiki or other urban neighborhoods, and they run frequently throughout the day and, in, and all, you know, every day. What I'm getting at is with the advent of rail, do you foresee a greater percentage going into a commuter route as far as uh, allocation of service hours, or do you f foresee the, the current mix? Well, you know, some of the some of our current routes are serving the same area that rail will be served, and so we'll make adjustments to those service hours or some of those routes uh, that where they might uh, might change or shift or or uh, operate on a on a different frequency. Um, we're still going to need bus service between the stations because mm -hmm. the, the rail stations are, in some cases, rather far apart. Uh, so the buses that are serving that area might still be there, but uh, in some cases they might run more frequently or less frequently, depending on, on what is needed. Um, as I mentioned, I think in some cases we're going to be moving more towards a feeder-type system where, where buses are connecting the local areas to the rail station, and we're encouraging people then to use rail to either get to their destination or to would, another location. Would you class that as a spoken hub system? Yes, yeah. Okay, because the only, sometimes the... Uh, initial obstacle or hurdle is mm -hmm. is those transfer times right whereas a, a, a rider is normally accustomed to getting on point a 
arrives at point B and there's no transfer in between. Right. And so that that is a, a challenge and, and getting those transfers down is, yes. a, is a bit of a challenge. It is, and, and that's why it's very important that uh, the rail system, which will be essentially our the spine of our, of our system runs very frequently mm -hmm. and provides very reliable service, which it will by being on, a, on an elevated guideway. So these trains will be running um, every few minutes, you know, right. something like every five or six minutes during the, the peak hours, maybe a little bit less frequently during the day, but to the point that where you re won't really need to look at the schedule. And um, the buses themselves, will do, we do our best to keep them on schedule, but you know, because of all the traffic, and because of a lot of construction activity and, and detours and things like that, it's harder for us to keep our, our bus system running on schedule. And, and that's why people so frequently are using those apps to find out when the next bus is coming. And uh, we'll do our best to time the departure of the buses at the rail station to match you know, when, the, when the rail station, uh, when the train comes in. So the train comes in, uh, people start coming downstairs, get on the buses, and then a minute or two later the buses will depart. Um, that's what we're shooting for. Yeah. Uh, but you know, in some cases, uh, uh, the the train might be running much more frequently than the than the bus themselves. Well, increased frequency means increased hours. Increased hours means increased budget. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee a, a new allocation of transit hours um, to match up with the connectivity of the rail? I think that everybody recognizes that this is going to be very, very important well into the future. Um, we, we want to provide the best possible transit system and, and make it efficient as possible. So um, we know that we're going to need additional uh, operating hours just with the, with the train itself. And we want to continue to provide the excellent bus service that we're already providing and make it better. Um, that takes money. Uh, I, you know, I can't say exactly what the budgets need to be uh, going out into the future, but uh, um, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to um, sacrifice the bus to provide uh, more service hours on the rail. It's got to be, it's got to be both because they all work together. Right. And it's very, very important. And you do have transit dependent people that are relying on these existing Absolutely. routes. And, and, um, and you know, um, we're providing more and more service on, on the handy van. Uh, we increased that budget by 20% in, in one year, the, the previous fiscal year, uh, to try and meet that demand, which is growing every year. You know, as our, as our elders continue to age, more and more people uh, rely on these types of services. And, and um, nobody should feel like they're isolated at home. We want to make sure that people can get around. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to provide access for, for our kids and for our elderly uh, to go out and do the things that they want to do. And that's where a, good, a really good transit system can, can support that. Well, you're hitting on uh, my next topic mm -hmm. here, and that is a transit system that is, can be used by all, one yeah. and all. And I, again, I hear an earful about why people won't ride the bus. Um, I don't know how to put this politely or diplomatically, but there's some kind of indication that you somehow take the public out of public transportation, which is to say there's people that they don't want to sit next to or they don't want to ride with because they feel one way or another, you know, maybe there's bad behavior or, mm -hmm. or things like that. So the question is, <clears throat> as I looked at the website, I know that um, there's a public safety portion, but is there a code of conduct for... Well, for we, the transit system? You know, we do have rules um, about uh, eating and drinking and, and no smoking and, and whatnot on, on the bus and, and uh, no bad behavior, no mm -hmm. playing loud music, things like that. Is that stated on the bus? It or is. is it just there, there, there are some rules mm -hmm. on, on, the, uh, on these signs that we have inside the bus. Um, but, you know, as you, as you mentioned, the bus is, uh, and the public transit system is really to provide service for everybody. Uh, so generally, we don't try to... Uh, kick people off the the bus or anything like that, uh, unless they're really behaving egregiously or, mm -hmm. or very badly. <clears throat> so uh, we do want to respect everybody, and we want everybody on the bus to uh, to respect each other. Uh, I understand that some people might uh, not take the bus, and I thought you were going to actually talk about some other things, and that some people would be more likely to ride the train than ride the bus, and and I think that 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 could be possible. Um, uh, but I think it's related to the, the service level that we're going to provide. Well, I think that gets back to an earlier question, and that was a commuter population mm -hmm. versus yeah. a non-commuter population, right. where there's a level of conduct or a code of conduct right. that's more applicable to a commuter um, train, rail, or, right. or even transit. And I guess that's what I'm trying to get at, is yes. how do we 
how do we address that before it actually occurs and to make sure that people feel comfortable from day one that they want to get on a system that is more um, rider friendly? Well, you know, um, we're going to do our best to make everybody feel welcome on both the, the bus and the train. And, and as we were talking, the, they really work together. So uh, once someone tries out the train, uh, let's say they, they drive now, but once the, the train starts running, they, they want to try it out. And if, if they like it, um, maybe they start by driving to one of these park and rides that you're talking about. And they have a good experience. It takes them to work or whatnot. Um, we're hoping that then they realize, oh, well, this also works in the evening to go to a restaurant or on the weekend to go to a, a football game at, uh, at a lower stadium or somewhere else, and they start to think about how transit can become part of their, part of their routine. And then uh, eventually they realize, oh, you know, the bus connects to the train. I, I could leave my car at home. I don't even have to drive, right? And, and then that whole thing starts to change people's mindsets, and, and people start to realize, hey, the, the whole transit system is great. It's good for everybody. And frankly, I, you know, I ride the bus every day, and I see everybody that you would imagine on the island is, is on the bus, uh, from rich to poor, all different, all different backgrounds. And, and it's great to see that, uh, that mix of people. Our Ohana is using the, using the transit system. It is. System. In fact, that's one of the reasons that um, the bus has been rated one of the top in the country. Yeah. And you've done a lot of heavy lifting and uh, to make it that kind of system. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Is there anything that, before you, you leave, is there any project or any task that you wish you had accomplished? Well, I, I do want to mention that there is a good thing coming up that we haven't really talked about. We've talked about technology, but um, you may not be aware, but we're actually moving towards an electronic uh, fare system. Um, or sometimes called a smart card. Yeah. So right now people use paper passes or they pay cash, but a couple of years from now, and in fact we're going to start testing it on the bus next year, you're going to be able to have a, a smart card which you can tap have a on chip. a reader. Have a it has a chip in it. in it and it's tied to your account and that's going to change the way people pay for the bus. It's going to provide all kinds of new opportunities. So I'm excited about that. There's good things coming up. That is actually, that's going to hope um, have the multimodal between the rail, the bus. Yep. Um, who knows? Maybe even be applicable to Uber or you know Lyft or something like that. Or, you never or, know. Or, or a bike share or bike parking. Share. Yeah. Uh, it could be that you load a value on this smart card, which could could end up being not your card but your phone in the future, and and you pay for you pay for a whole variety of things this way. Who, so. who knows? Maybe the more you use it, more credit you get. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> we'll I didn't mean to put words in your mouth no. on that. Well, again, as I said, there's a lot more questions I have today than we have time. So, Mark, I'd like to say, uh, say thank you very much for thank joining you. us today. And I think we've learned a lot. Yeah. And uh, today's show is um, now over. And this is Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.